So uh, I want to talk about games uh, about care. So um, we already had like um, some games about um, sort of things that are more like activities um, uh, of self-care, like building a farm or um, social activities that you have with other people in a sort of anonymous fashion. Um, I'm just going to be talking more about care in a sort of philosophical um, pattern because actually above games um, m might not be like super nice to play always. They're a little bit confrontational, although they sort of have themes that connect this. So the two thing, games I want to talk about is one, a quite recent one, is Eliza by Zachtronics, and the other is Tacoma by Fulbright. Um, and uh, we'll get into why I picked these two. We'll start with a bit of Tacoma. Tacoma is a, is a so-called um, simulation game. Uh, and that means, in this case, that means a physical simulation. Um, it means you can throw darts, uh, you can shoot balls, you can pick things up, you can throw them around, you can um, put them back. Um, so it's mainly a physical simulation. Uh, the thing you can't actually do is really interact with people, which is sort of the irony of it all. Um, uh, so this game kind of follows on from Gone Home, the last game Fulbright made, uh, and is very much in the same vein, if you're familiar with it, you kind of discover um, the story um, as sort of fragments scattered around you. And now with sort of added AR recordings of scenes that have already happened, but you don't really interact with it. Um, in fact, it's so non-interactive that you could conceivably play the game by just looking at this little booklet in four different locations and waiting around an hour at each junction and then bring the story to completion. Obviously, that's really boring, but it just sort of highlights the fact that the game doesn't really require much of you and in that sense, actually, might be quite relaxing, um, as a lot of sort of these sort of walking simulators are. Um, it kind of invites you to go exploring at each location, but you're no, under no obligation to do so. Um, and in this exploration, it gives you a sense of place by sort of dressing the um, environment in interesting ways and giving evidence of of personality to decorations and other things. Um, so the player as a bystander in this way is a very common strategy in video games that have a very strong narrative focus. It makes it easier. Things are linear, you don't affect things, there are no branches. Um, it gives you tight control. Um, so in this way, it tells you a story um, by taking most of your control away. So um, to sort of introduce Eliza here, we have Eliza. In Eliza, you uh, play a therapist um, in a visual novel type game. Um, a visual novel is a type of branching stories that mostly offer you A, B, C, or D choices, and you explore each branch of the narrative as you go down it. Um, and follows very much like a literary tradition. There's lots of words. Um, there might be multiple paths, but it's still um, a quite a traditionally told story. Um, and in fact, actually, um, the writer of this game, Matthew Say Burns, started off with a tool called Twine, which some of you might be familiar with, which is a very popular tool to create um, interactive narrative that's all around branching storylines. Um, so often visual no uh, uh, novels and branching stories, they offer you lots of options. Uh, ways to travel around. Sometimes the branches come back together and sometimes they go apart. Eliza is actually quite extraordinary that um, it offers you very little to no choice. Uh, and as you can see here, you have one dialogue option that's even being fed to you by your Eliza program. Um, you are in this case a proxy for a therapist and you are being instructed by an automated script to tell, um, that tells you what to respond to clients. In this case, you're um, saying hello to somebody by talking about the weather. Um, so in a way, the story sort of propels you forward by its own violation. You really don't have much of any effect on it. Um, that might be a bit strange for a game. Games usually are about interactivity and about um, affecting the narrative 
And the open question is, is why is a story like this that virtually offers no choice at all not better served by a movie or a book? And in fact, we can see uh, our first patient that we encounter in this visual novel um, echo that in his own ways. He is depressed and he thinks that nothing matters, uh, just like our choices in this game, which also do not really matter. Um, so, even though you're not interacting with it, actually, this, this very slide shows the tension that we do get from this interaction. Um, the very notion that we're expected to interact with a video game, yet we only get to go forward as through a slideshow, very much like we're doing now, um, brings to, like forward the central tension of the game is like, what does interactivity without consequence mean? And you start to express yourself through these sort of meaningless interactions. Um, and the choice itself, and not so much the consequence, comes interesting. Um, you know, the fa very fact that you're making a choice, even if you're forced to do it, sort of makes it your own. Um, and it echoes the, the themes of the game, which are about hopelessness and powerlessness. Uh, so in that way, the game is quite neat. Um, and the tension of this is brought to the foreground in sessions like this, where oftentimes you'll have more than one option, but here, literally, um, the proxy response, what you were supposed to say back to this person is loading, and it's gonna come back um, and tell you what to tell you, and that's then your only option. Um, again, sort of um, ramming home this notion of um, powerlessness, in a way. Um, we can also see this in sort of repeated lines like this. Um, you will mention the weather over and over again um, with several patients that you see. These rote lines, these introductions feel very structured and sort of inadequate. You're supposed to be a therapist and help these people along somehow. Um, even when you go off script, um, it is instructed by you, by the program, right? Darren, I'm gonna go get into trouble if I deviate from Eliza too long, Eliza being your instructing program. Um, this cheers him up greatly as he now has the notion that he's talking to a human being, right? We can say, wait, say something weird, say something only a human would say. He's desperate, he wants some human connection. The script will provide. Um, so even subversion of the scripted moment is actually easily scriptable um, in a way that I think is quite relevant in all sorts of ways that go beyond this presentation. But I, I thought it was an interesting point to make. Um, we can also see the confines of the script. Um, here, um, you have just recommended a, a drug in a very American fashion. Ask your uh, physician to request this drug for you because that's the way it works. And you probably have some kind of kickback deal going on. Uh, somebody asks you for the name of that and you're like, thank you for speaking with Eliza, your personal counseling partner. Obviously, you have no um, capacity to actually answer this question and you can see the seams of the script appear. Again, bringing home this idea of powerlessness. Uh, and in fact, actually, it reminds me a lot of uh, uh, one of my favorite jobs in the past, which was uh, working in a call center uh, where we had scripts very much like this, uh, including strategies for keeping people on the phone, you know, essential information to get in these kind of flow diagrams, uh, uh, and also, you know, the control of going off script. And, you know, we live in a world now that these therapy apps may be not like as an AR overlay with like a human proxy such as an Eliza, but we certainly have therapist apps of different people and profiles you can find, people you can rate, and it wouldn't be that surprising if a lot of them follow templates and structure. Um, and in fact, um, one of the things, the recent crazes, obviously, which this ties into is this notion of wellness. If you work in office long enough, you'll be offered some kind of wellness course that is very expensive. Um, and that will teach you breathing exercises and such, or you might have encountered one of the virtual reality 
uh, um, sort of meditative uh, exercises such as this, and it's certainly in our future, this idea of the stress of modern life being taken away by a virtual picture of some kind of peaceful moment in a cute uh, house somewhere, or maybe enigmatic things that you get from a phone app, horoscopes, or whatever, or meaningful sayings that people give you on Facebook, you know, open-ended advice such as there's no need to rush, um, which can be applicable anywhere, really. Um, you know, it's all this part of this sort of wellness thing, this sort of vaguely East Asian religious experience without calling it religious, like this wellness thing of taking it easy and, you know, um, you know, being less full of ego and all these things. Um, certainly this all fits into there. Um, and, you know, all of this is backed by um, what I would consider the modern church, uh, the server room, right? All these apps are powered by rows and rows of machines. Even your machine you have at home, your mobile phone is a very intricate, almost architectural product of, of worship in a way. And certainly if you look at pictures of, of a big servers, um, you will find these grand perspective lines and lights and you know, there's something to be said. Maybe these are modern cathedrals. Uh, and in fact, actually, you know, a lot of people make the connection of mysticism to these places. We can see here a conversation you have with somebody who runs the place and, um, you know, they think this therapy program, which is obviously trained by AI and lots of conversation, um, you know, it trains itself and here is given some kind of godliness or spiritfulness, something that we pray to, something that alleviates our pain. Um, and, you know, maybe there's something to that, right? Um, maybe not in the sense of the runaway Frankenstein monster that we're all afraid of, the Skynet that is going to become sentient and decide that the world is better off without us, but maybe there is something for it to be said for these systems, like these rote scripts, these techniques of therapy, these methods of self-care, these routine conversations you have with yourself and others and professionals have with you in various capacities. In some ways, they are the product of a lot of humanity. So perhaps slightly provocatively, the game also asks maybe the script sometimes is enough and it does actually do something for us. And how often do we find ourselves repeating a, a script of some kind to comfort ourselves or comfort somebody else? And who are we to judge the artificialness of going through kind of some scripted event of another and sort of like devoiding that of humanity? Well, it is also the product of humanity. Um, it is, unfortunately, something that is entangled in very large corporations, such as this app, all this data crunching and this app making obviously takes a big financial organization. And this brings us back to Tacoma, a future that imagines us to study at universities such as Hilton U or Amazon University, um, after which you can uh, graduate, uh, get paid in company, script like their own kind of money, and be totally indentured. And then your misery will be sold back to you in the form of, you know, automated daily health routines remembered by your closet, or holidays that are projected in your home home for, you know, vacation bungalows with families that look magically happier than your own. Um, So in Tacoma, we ex so uh, Eliza is a very sort of like private experience, whereas Tacoma sort of explores a social space. It sort of very effectively explores the boundary between sort of public and private faces. As we see these people on a spaceship, obviously something goes wrong and you have to investigate it and see what happens. You're a detective of sorts, but it's sort of like not 
I mean, it's a reason to be there and kind of unfurl things, but it's really an excuse, a MacGuffin, to get to know the people um, that go through this experience. And this is a nice little moment that illustrates how it operates. These people are no longer there. They're just as these holographic ghosts that you can play back at your leisure. Um, and you can see them have public conversations. And then you can see them have private ones, such as this one, right? You can see these two people are walking away. They've just discussed the plan and says, oh, I can't believe everyone went along with this. So everybody has either with their closer friends or in private have these relationships to these public, more public moments. Um, so we can, in this sense, we can explore the choices of other people, even though we can't interact with it. Whereas Eliza is about exploring the ineffectiveness of our own choices, perhaps. Um, we can hear without influencing um, other people's lives, inspect their choices. Um, and we, we get to explore these people's lives through artifacts that we see. They're no longer there, they're just echoes. Um, and we, yeah, we can see them in private moments such as this one, where people, somebody here is talking to an AI, not, again, not unlike Eliza's proxy service here, Odin, the um, all-knowing AI of the ship acts as a, as a priest or a therapist or a god hearing prayer or some uncertainty. Um, it doesn't give much good advice, but it's there and it listens. Um, so we explore these various people through their artifacts, right? We see the front of their door and we can see this person likes to keep their shoes outside of the door. This is sort of a salient detail that tells us something about his character. Um, other people are messy and clean. You know, we saw a, like quite a clean office just a few slides ago and now we're about to experience somebody's private moment and we can see that behind the clean facade of the organized office there's also things like drinking happening. And who would have thought that? Um, again, exploring the duality of like a public life and a private moment where somebody um, is clearly encouraged to drink a lot because they're sad. Um, so uh, this, this kind of like gameplay has a long tradition in games. Um, it's praised a lot. It's called environmental storytelling. It has a long history. Uh, games like Half-Life or Bioshock, of which the guys who made this are alumni or system shock, other kinds of shock, um, they, they, they all sort of play with this and they are praised for this because the cinematic or strong narrative experience before this was characterized by cutscenes that take away the control and you sit and watch something and when you're interacting with something, being disturbed to watch a cutscene is something a lot of people don't like. So what they do instead is they spray blood on the, on the walls and they leave weird toys around and other sort of artifacts of humanity and people analyze those in a sort of um, yeah in a sort of observant or kind of pervy way if you will um, and um, it's interesting that the guys here they worked at Bioshock and you can see that they have actually taken the element of environmental uh, storytelling and uh, sort of rested it loose from the notion of shooting other people in the face, which was always what was happening in tandem with that. And they just thought, well, hey, what happens if we just do the storytelling bit? Won't that be nice? And in fact, actually, it is quite nice. I recommend the game, it's, it's nice. Um, the reason, you know, uh, environmental storytelling also works is, you know, cutscenes takes away control. There's no interactivity with environmental storytelling. Uh, there is, but there's no interactivity with people. Actually, interactivity with people is very hard to simulate for all sorts of reasons um, that I won't get into, but even like authoring the story level on the notion you can say anything to anybody, you can imagine the amount of things that you would have to author to actually successfully bring such a story to close. And there's also a question of how clear a story you could tell with something like that. So this is, I mentioned Twine and Eliza, so uh, Matthew, the, the author, he started off writing stories in Twine, and this is what it looks like. Go and try it, it's great. But basically, you can see here all the branches and the choices, they lead to different bits. Um, you can imagine what kind of explosion it would lead to if you actually wanted to make a lot of things possible in every scene, and you didn't bring points back together, or you didn't limit people's choices. Um, we simply do not have enough people in the world to make that work. Um, 
So here we see somebody in their office again, sort of like um, presenting. So in, in this sort of like this idea of this notion of uh, uh, looking at other people's stuff and seeing what they go through, it kind of manages to be more personal and less personal than Eliza. Less personal because you're not the one making the choices, but also more personal because you get to explore the other in both their public and their private uh, being. And you can see here, this manager of the, the, the station is doing something sneaky and private. Okay, right. Uh, right, here the private, private nature of Eliza also plays a large role in the story. This is her room and here she's telling that she's sort of like turned away from the world, um, just hiding out here. The, the clean office of the therapist office is sort of neatly contrasted in the sort of semi-messy state her room is in. Um, and the game actually sort of like quite neatly underlines the fact that you don't have any choice in your period where you kind of turn away from the world and just stay at home um, is not really walking away from your life in a, a substantial way at all. Um, and by the end of the game, you actually have a choice. Rather than retreat, you need to choose a new way forward. Uh, and that way, it sort of gives you the option to actually do something with your life afterwards, um, which is interesting. Uh, and then finally, um, Tacoma sort of ends you with that sort of the AI helping you out. Um, um, it sort of helps you out in that computer way where it can't tell you what to do, but it can tell you what you probably should be doing in sort of Volta terms. Uh, and as such, it kind of helps um, somebody save the, the members of the ship through this strategy that you're playing through. Um, again, sort of like giving rise to the notion that maybe AI imbued with all our experience might have some humanity after all. Um, so I, I don't know, I thought that was two quite nice sort of semi-connected messages. I would uh, invite you both to play these games. They're both very good, very good voice acting, and good writing. And I think they both explore interesting notions of what it means to care.